Warning. The following episode contains subject matter and scenes that some viewers may find upsetting, disturbing, or unnerving. Please note, viewer discretion is advised at all times. Sit back and enjoy. Are your meat cuts tasting bland and dull? Do you long for a local butcher that cares for quality? Why not take a trip to your local family farm, The Picton Farm, a place where we care, we provide, and we dig deep into a trusted Canadian society for the purest of cuts and a quality of meat with conviction from farm to plate. Try our brand new sausages with flavors you've never before experienced. We've slashed our prices too so much they'll make you squeal Welcome back to another I Could Murder a Podcast episode number three of series five. I'm Tom Norris and old McNozzer had a farm. E I E I. Yo, it's Ben Carter. Very, very good. How are you doing? I'm not bad, so how are you? Very well, very well. We're back with another case, another Robert. Two Roberts in a row, Tom. There's a bloody lot of Roberts coming out doing naughty stuff, aren't there, Ben? A lot of Bobbies. A lot of bloody Bobbies. Hey. And Willies. We'll get into that. Before we start, Ben, I noticed something the other day which is new. Mm-hmm. And I know you like new things. Love it. On Spotify now, they, you can do a rating. Mm-hmm. And I think there's over 300 people have been lovely and actually rated us already. But if more people could do that, that'd be great because it spreads the word. It gets the word out there. If, you're, if you, you haven't got Spotify, you've got iTunes. You don't discriminate. You can give us a rating on yeah, there as well. The, the OG raters, I believe. They are. And it, it as well, if you give um, a funny review, we'll read it out on the pod. Yeah, and the funniest or pithiest or wittiest one, use a lot of in-jokes with us. Yeah. That'll, that'll win us round. We'll read, read it out in a future episode. We film in batches, so it's kind of hard to know. When, but we'll we will get yeah. it out there. We'll give you a little shout out. A lot of in jokes and a lot of stars, if you can. Um, yeah, yeah. If you're giving us one star and just calling us absolute <laughs> mugs, then you're not going to be read out. Use that. How you doing, producer Dan? I am feeling great, thank you very much. You've got a very particular look about you today, Tom. Yeah, I've gone um, for the ultra dance today. Uh, <laughs> I've got the tash, the glasses, and the jacket. Um, or I'm an 80s mum. Ultra nonce, that's good. Ultra yeah. nonce. Uh, but I'm, I'm hoping if I go, f- if I've gone full nonce, I've gone full circle and gone back into being normal again. So, that, so there's nothing above ultra nonce. Is that the, the highest you can go in terms of, <sighs> or lowest? I don't know. I don't know, Dan. I threw a word out there, made it up. I thought I'd get in there first before the comments go, it looks like Ned Flanders. Oh, he looks like a bloody... Yeah. Water off a duck's back. Mm. Um, doesn't phase him. So uh, myself, I eagle... Uh, flying into a pack of wolves, you probably can't quite see the pack of wolves. It's like something from Brett from Flight of the Concourse of Wear. Okay, yeah, I'll, ta- I'll take that. Yeah, it's not a bad thing. take that, yeah. Um, and, the, and the helmet hair, like Brett from Flight of the Concourse as well. Yeah, yeah. Just to, Are you going to take that as well? Tried something different. Um, People seem to like it. So far, so good. A lot of good comments. Oh, Ben's hair looks fit. What? Fire emoji. Wow, what's Ben done with his hair? Yeah. Can Ben reverse time and did not do... I was like, that's a bit harsh. Delete it so you can see it. <laughs> But the rest of them are loving the hair. And yeah, I mean, I'm not slagging off the clothes. Obviously, a big thank you to Gully Garms for dressing yes. us this series. And this is more Gully Garms Charms, as we like to call it. And if you go over there and use the code MURDER20, you'll get 20% off at checkout, which is a bloody bargain. There's lots of good retro finds over there, lots of gems, hidden gems in there. So be sure to go over there and check them out. If you want to keep in the loop of all things I Could Murder a Podcast, why not follow us over on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook? Um, we haven't quite made it to TikTok yet. Still trying to work out what it all means. But for Instagram and Twitter, you can find us at at Could Murder a Pod. And for Facebook, just search Could Murder a Pod or I Could Murder a Podcast or Murder Podcast and we'll eventually pop up somewhere. But Dan, the... Dan was saying about the Facebook community that it's been really popping up over there. We really like them and respect them. Yeah. So they're really active and I love it. I love the Facebook community. I'm not saying I love them more than the Instagram or the Twitters or the YouTubers. I like them all, but the Facebook ones just have a bit of pizzazz about them. There you go. And the one he didn't quite get to, but very special in our hearts, are the Patreonies. Oh, that goes without saying, Ben. <laughs> if they didn't think that, then they're 
they're idiots. Of course, the Patreonies have a huge place in my heart. So if you're liking what you're seeing and you're liking what you're hearing, why not head over for some extra content to our Patreon page, which is patreon.com forward slash pod. We've got almost 60 episodes up there right now. Most of them are request cases, uh, some mysteries, some, uh, some, uh, um, some real mysteries, actually. Yeah, some mysteries. <laughs> There's also just just normal cases that aren't a mystery and have been yeah. solved. A lot of times when we, we tend to do this in series, we tend to lose our noggins a little bit and we start going, oh, we need someone to vote for a new episode of this series. But on there, if you set some votes for kind of a smaller case, you know, like, oh, I was never going to win the audience vote. Yeah. If you go over to Patreon, if you put the, your vote in, it will end up in a poll. Yeah. So you have a chance for us covering it over on there. They tend to snowball. I mean, the other week we did a case about a shark puncher, of all things. And he didn't even punch a shark. Yeah, no mystery, mystery solved. And if you want to support us in another way, why not head over to icmap.store? Because over there, you can get you can support us and get a physical thing. If mm. you think, you know, seeing us, is, oh, it doesn't really count, because what happens if I, you know, I'm quite forgetful, I forget that I've watched an episode. If you get a mug, you'll never forget it. Mm. And also, we've now got jumpers over there. We've got T-shirts, we've got posters, we've got a bloody candle. Mm. So, uh, why not head Tote over Tote bags, there? stickers, badges, we've got a lot. All those things as well. Yeah. But they're, they're lesser money, so... No, the hats as well. They're, don't forget the hats. Hats are great, though, aren't they? You wear them when it's yeah, cold or hot. Year round. Yeah, just just swipe along and you'll see all the things over there. Any, any sports greatly appreciated. And also, a cheeky little tip. If you're a Patreone, mm. you get a cheeky little discount. So i um, not trying to force your hand, but think about it. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. Wow. Before we continue, we just wanted to say a massive thank you to the sponsors of this week's episode, Dead Happy. Ben, there is literally millions of ways to die. You can get stung by a bumblebee, you can be eating an apple and there's a bumblebee in it, and you swallow it and you choke on the bumblebee. Yeah. Bumblebee could be driving a heavy goods vehicle and run over you. That's just three bee-related deaths. Yeah. And I'm sure there's many other ways yeah. you can die uh, without bees. And I read the fine print in Dead Happy, they would cover you for any bee-related death. If you got a load of bees and made them sting you, is that suicide? Right, there's an intention to be. How can you prove it? You're you're slapping the queen's butt. (laughs) So that's where dead happy come in, Tom. All bee-related, I would say injuries, but they could mount up to something fatal. And that's the last one. Don't sleep on the bees, because they they are dangerous. But they make cracking honey. And if worst comes to the worst, Tom, all things bee-related, the last thing you're going to want is to be stung when you don't have the right life insurance policy in place. So Ben, you know me, and one thing I hate more than David Hasselhoff is hassle. And that's the great thing about Dead Happy. It's so simple to get started. There's no medicals needed. They'll ask you four simple questions and then you're up and running. They truly take the hassle off. Yeah, they die. A lot of people die, die in Baywatch. Let's Bay get yeah. down here, shall we? Yeah. Uh, drowning, the bee stung you. You can't swim very well. So you're yeah. drowning. Underwater bees. Uh, that is sea bees. No. Boobies. Baywatch. Come on, come yeah. on, come on. <laughs> I'm just that bed you You are. Pervert. Choking. On a bee. Oh. What are you on about? Choking on a bee. <laughs> Choking on a bee. Surely. Surely. Death's everywhere, Tom. That's the fact. There's no getting away from that. Everyone, sadly, is going to die. And if you didn't know that, I'm sorry to break it to you. Why are you learning that from me? Someone's let you down. Uh, but tell you who won't let you down, Dead Happy. Tell yeah. them why, then. Dead Happy are also the home of the 10-year roller. Oh, that sounds like a delicious sandwich. But I'm probably guessing it's not, because why would Dead Happy be selling sandwiches? Can you educate me in the 10-year roller? You silly fool, of course I can. So at Dead Happy, they offer the 10-year roller, which is a 10-year payout guarantee where each year the Dead Happy team will check in to see if things have changed, and if they can, they'll offer you a reset for another 10 years, and if not, you'll still have the original guarantee. Uh, Then you can afford more sandwiches. It's all making sense now. And of course, don't just take our word for it. Dead Happy are rated excellent on trust pilot which is a high level to get to so dead happy are offering this deal to i could murder a podcast listeners for a limited time only so make sure you get yourself over there and get yourself over there quick yeah because the deal doesn't last forever and neither do you you're not invincible i know you think you are but you're not one day we're all going to be under the ground and with supporting us you can also support your loved ones so make sure that honeypot doesn't rot get over to deadhappy.com and enter the code murder at checkout and get yourself a deadly discount today and back to the case So, Tom, last week we covered a butcher called Robert. A baker. Butcher and a baker. Butcher by name, baker by nature. So, handsome by name, uh, baker by occupation, and butcher as hobby. But I'd say more Mm. of a hunter. I didn't really like the name. 
but yeah, we're still unsure. But this one, what are your thoughts on this name, the Pig Farmer Killer? Well, it sounds like he it, it just kills pig, pig farmers. farmers. Yeah. He doesn't do it, obviously. That'd be a bit niche. <laughs> but he does look like the kind of person that would kill you pig farmers. Fuck. <laughs> So this week's Robert, Robert Picton, very much butcher by name, butcher by nature. And just to clarify, he goes by the name the Pig Farmer Killer. Mm -hmm. Doesn't kill pig farmers. That's a trap I fell into very early. What, happened, niche. what happened you fell in the trap? Uh, turned a page. What book were you reading? This ain't the right book. <laughs> and then they shortly afterwards kicked me out of the library. Charlotte's a spider. Hmm? Although going by his appearance, he, he does look like sort of the end boss of the pig farmers. No disrespect to any pig farmers tuning in, of course. But yeah, grisly, grisly case. Yes. One that we did an Instagram post about way back in the day, just because images of him are too, looks like a mo like a straight to DVD horror movie. Yeah, yeah, I know what um, you mean, exactly. He, 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 essentially, he goes from pig shit to pig git when he goes around <laughs> ki killing. <laughs> and I'd say, Ben, yeah, I completely agree with those points there. Mm. And, and we'll get into it, but he goes from pig shit to pig git um but he's, he's a very mucky chap he also went by the names yeah the butcher like ben said pig farm killer pork chop rob pig head killer the pig farm killer and pork chop willy which sounds like yeah. you put that one in did you make that one i up? did put it in but put it in what in this in the uh, in the script did you make it up no it's, it's out there oh, it's out there it does sound like one i'd make up yes <clears throat> um, but so does pork chop rob um bacon <laughs> Fucking hell. Would be what I put in there. I'm very much looking forward to seeing what Dr. Das has to say about this case because there's so many layers to it. His childhood was absolutely yeah. horrendous. So I think there's lots of things for him to dissect later on. Our resident doctor, so be sure to stick around for him later on as well. And if you haven't already, why not subscribe to his channel, Psych for Sort of Minds? It'll be in our description below. Absolutely. And this is our first time, Tom, in Canada. Yes. Uh, I've been going for a few series now and we've not made our way. To the far north, Canada. Yeah. It's chilly, isn't it? Very chilly, although I've heard they had quite nice summers. And what better Canadian case to start with than one of the most infamous and notorious Canadian serial killers of all time, Robert Picton. Yeah, and I always want to say Picton. And we're going to get into the case now, and we're going to look at his childhood and see how he ended up being such a bake. But yeah, lots and lots to dissect. We'll, we'll try not to get hung up on the details. Yeah. I'm, I'm just ribbing you. I'm sure the viewers won't rind if we get a few things wrong. Yeah, probably not. Um, <laughs> I hope we're not going to ham on our outfits. Oh, my loins! Um, <laughs> just, just words. But shall we get into it, Ben? <laughs> Let's do it. Let's stop pigging about. Getting piggy with it. Um, Making bacon. You'll be in a baker. <laughs> Robert William Picton was born on the 24th of October 1949 in Port Coquitlam, British Columbia, which is not too far from Vancouver. He was the middle-born and eldest son of Leonard and Helen Louise Picton, a pair of pig farmers who were well known in the local community as people to essentially steer clear of, mainly due to their fairly unkempt and scruffy appearances, but also due to their unusual and brash mannerisms, and also due to their odours. Yeah, there seems to be a theme throughout this of the mm. of the odours. I mean... Can't get rid of it. Where I used to live, there used to be a turkey farm and they used to just waft around the smell everywhere. So imagine if you worked there, it probably would stay on you. And pig farming, I, I imagine the same. But these two apparently really weren't too bothered about, about cleaning themselves up and making themselves look pretty. Because the mother as well, her hygiene was next level and mm -hmm. she just let all of her teeth rot out. Yeah. And her hair was very unkempt. But she's very work obsessed. Yes. Mum. Yeah. Whereas her dad was slightly uh, more lazy and a bit more of a not a great father. Yeah, definitely. Well, so, you'd argue the mother's not great either, but we'll get, we'll get into it. Yeah, so uh, the father, Leonard, was a very distant and regarded as quite lazy by the rest of the family, widely considered unambitious. His mother, Helen, was very much the active kind of hands-on parent in the household, and there was actually quite a notable age gap between mother and father. Helen was actually 16 years younger than Leonard. And you couldn't fault their work ethic. They were a family of grafters, but it was what was going on behind closed doors, barn doors mostly, actually. The swines. that led to the problems. So the family were very much regarded as working class family, and as Ben said, they would go around and, you know, people would know them as being a little bit stinky, but they kept it out of sight and out of mind. They weren't really getting into too much trouble in, in the actual local area, and they owned quite a lot of land. But the farm as well wasn't in the best of states. Animals were left to roam freely around the farm, 
and between the barns, as well as in the Picton house. Yeah, at one, at one point they had 700 pigs. That's a lot of... That is a lot of pigs. A lot of pigs. Kermit's wet dream. Hi ho, Kermit the Frog here. Hi! <laughs> Fucking hell. But it quickly turned into a nightmare. Um, oh, oh. So the Picton family farm, as Tom said, was in a really bad way. So the way I view it is that they were just kind of quantity over quality. Yeah. Get the animals in, get the animals out. They looked for shortcuts, didn't they? And let's try to pinch the pennies and pinching the pennies would result in yeah, certain uh, certain quality, like you said. And also in, in the future, they would look to try and cut corners in terms of staff in terms of where, where can they save money? And even if that meant bad news for their children, if it meant yeah. more money for them, then that was the goal. Yeah, I mean, they were kind of desensitised to the idea of neglect or, or pain or suffering, which is something that young Willie would go through. So the family farm itself was on a remote wooded area, isolated away from the rest of society. The property itself was filled with streams and woodlands and wildlife, which in, in most instances, for a young boy, uh, he had a younger brother as well, an ideal scenario to kind of grow up, explore the great outdoors have adventures you know little stream maybe skim a few stones <laughs> play poo sticks what's that you know what poo sticks is no mate what's poo don't you know what poo sticks is what you don't know what that is what's poo sticks Winnie oh the... is, is it from Winnie the Pooh yeah it, yeah it probably is yeah that would make well, sense you, you drop a stick in a stream and then you you have a race with the sticks oh that's not what I, I didn't think that that was what it was what do you think well, it was Ben we did it always sticks. on a bridge sorry to clarify uh, yeah it. bridges makes yeah, it funner yeah, yeah. yeah what do you think it was Ben uh, two guys or girls or just a group of people all drop a poo in the stream and see who can cut it up with a stick quickest poo sticks fuck me wow cut not? it up quickest oh. yeah just dissolve it you know dissolve it a lot of um, fuck me a lot of um, factors into who would win um that's environmental, right. physical, um, mental, emotional. Um, Corn for grip. Yeah. But yeah, ugh, that's disgusting. In the Picton family world, let's not rule it out. No, we will rule it out. We don't know. No, we will rule that out. Lots of streams, lots of... Yeah, but no one's doing that. Dissolve. Yeah. We'll just mash it up. Imagine him with a t toilet brush. See, it's better for the pipes. Just smacking it. <laughs> 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 Like Mexican birthday parties when they get the piñata out, except from sticks, streams and shit. It's not very similar. You get sweets out of it at the end of the piñata, I don't think you get much sweets. out of this. Corn. So when Willie was born, when he came into the world, he was born with an umbilical cord wrapped around, tightly around his neck. And the people would go on to speculate whether this would actually lead to him having some form of brain damage. Although this is rare, it can lead to a kind of oxygen flow to the brain. And this can, also can you know, stunt development there. And this may involve compression of the carotid artery. Yeah, so I mean, his, he developed at a fair, fairly normal rate as a child, but he would have instances where he'd kind of be found in a, in a daze occasionally. He'd also have problems with his speech. So some of the family believe that this might have been a result of being born with the umbilical cord uh, wrapped around his neck. So as a child, he did prefer to go by the name Willie. He had an older sister called Linda. However, uh, there was kind of a mutual decision between the family for her to leave the family farm at quite a young age. They basically believed, uh, or kind of mutually believed, that it was not an appropriate place to raise a young lady. Yeah, Linda apparently wasn't, she didn't feel very at home there anyway. She didn't like how messy everything was. She didn't particularly get on with her parents anyway. Apparently her mum much preferred the brothers rather than her. So I think it was a mutually beneficial thing, her leaving the family farm. Ever since then, she's very much distanced herself from that side of the family. Apparently, the contact between her and her parents just completely kind of stopped when she left. I think it was around about the age of 12. And I think she probably made the right decision. Yeah. Rubbish at poo sticks as well. She was awful. I mean, you sound like you would be terrible at it. <laughs> would you rather be good at it or terrible at it? Which one? Real poo sticks. Oh, real poo sticks. Sorry. <laughs> not your Sorry. poo sticks. Not, they're not mine. They are definitely yours. No. Imagine your children, fucking hell. Come on, guys. Going to play the family game of poo sticks. <laughs> Daddy's going first. <laughs> so all in all, Willie had a very hard life from a very young age. The family actually made him live in a converted chicken coop, um, which became extremely cold during the winter months. And whenever Willie would cry or express any kind of unhappiness or discontent, his mother wouldn't sympathise with him. She would simply shut him away in this chicken coop. And he was, you know, kind of forced to live in a really confined... I mean, no child should live in that sort of environment. No, I mean, he was, he was a toddler at the age and the only way to access fresh water was underneath the floorboards. And yeah, it's him kind of learning to survive and be very independent at that age. 
absolutely horrible no, you know, no child should have to live and be raised in that kind of way so Willie and his younger brother David were made to work on the family farm from a very very young age this included the boys witnessing first hand animals being slaughtered on a regular basis and their carcasses and remains being displayed throughout the household and throughout the barns as we said it was not the tidiest looking pig farm you ever did see um their carcasses and remains were often hung and, and butchered in front of the boys, and this most likely desensitised uh, the Picton brothers from a very early age. Working on the farm was obviously no easy gig as well. The parents run a very tight machine in terms of the way that they, they had their operation going. The parents were very demanding of their boys and seemed to care a lot more about the pigs and the farm itself than their own flesh and blood. The boys from a very early age would work extensive hours, and it was physical labour as well. As a result, the boys' personal hygiene suffered much like as Tom mentioned the parents uh, had already neglected their own hygiene and the boys were forced to work in kind of really dirty conditions as well amidst a load of uh, livestock. So we've already mentioned about where um, Willie was being put um, and being made forced to live at times uh, under the, in, in the chicken coop but sadly for Willie that's not where it, it didn't end there. At the age of three he was severely beaten by his father and when his dad was apparently um, getting something out of the back of this um, pickup truck and Willie was left in the front seat at the age of three and somehow he managed to start the car and drive forward, crashing the car on the wall. And then his dad severely beat, beat him up after that uh, at the age of three. As well, obviously, with the boys working on the farm constantly and, you know, the parents not being overly fond of hygiene. I don't think the kind of parents that go, have a bath and wash well in your ears. They're probably like, get out of the house and go to school. They would go to school, obviously, smelling of the farm. And this got them, to, you know, this resulted in them getting bullied at school. And obviously with Willie being kind of, he's quite isolated in his thinking as well. He wasn't very social. He kind of struggled to make friends. Mm. And this, this, this earned the boys the name of Stinky Piggy from the classmates. And usually with the, the childhoods that we list off with different cases we've covered in the past, you'd go through maybe a couple of paragraphs about all these difficult times that they endured. We're only about halfway, we're manured. We're only about halfway through the, uh, the abuse. Not only the abuse, but the difficult upbringing. Uh, that, that Picton went through um, and it only gets worse it seems the farm life there's been a few farmers we've covered or yeah. work with animals that doesn't ever seem to, yeah, to end well. gain yeah so as well as the nickname Stinky Piggy from their classmates there would also be a bit of a community name against the family which was referred to as the Picton Stink it would become a well known term amongst locals due to its very distinct and very potent odour Dan that's like the uh, cut of fire. The what? The Carter Fada. He didn't know about that. No, I didn't. Yeah? yeah no one's. Very, very distinct smell. Oh. Cartier. Cartier. Piss. Huh? I, I mean, I guess, guys, you could say um, young Willie Picton was a young Willie that was picked on. And now that stinks. Ben writes all these down. Shut up. Fuck. Whoa. <laughs> the way you just... So Willie had a mild learning disability and by the third grade he was placed into special education. He would be teased by his classmates or he's been teased by them already and this kind of fervid is teasing. This bullying is believed to have a lasting impact to him socially as he was growing up. Obviously it does affect people in different ways. It made him kind of further distance himself from people. Dr. Das actually has a very interesting theory about that might have, might have been a reason why his hygiene as well wasn't the way it was. So we, mm -hmm. I'm, ex I'm excited for you guys to hear that as well. And when Willie spoke as well, he would often splutter his words and spoke at a pace much too fast. And this again resulted in further bullying, which talking fast, getting bullied for that. I mean... Yeah, we never go at you. No, and I speak very fast. Yeah. And you're very slow and kind of a Labrador yeah. turned into a human. Well, that was hit by a bus. Um, Fuck <laughs> And also because the school was quite actually middle class and, and upper middle class, that really didn't help the Picton brothers and they, they stood out for a mile. Like two sore thumbs yeah. covered in pig shit. Yeah, that was one part that really surprised me. Not the two thumbs, but the fact that they were at, by the sound of it, well, it was a community school, but mm. in the, the area that they were in, a lot of wealthy kind of higher middle class and upper class a families good, A good there. catchment area. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And It's very um, important to look for yeah. a good catchment area. And the Pictons got in. A lot of the influence that you see with Picton, I mean, he was very attached to his mother, Helen, uh, throughout his life. He used to be physically attached to her as well by an umbilical cord, but that went around his neck when he was growing up, and we think yeah. that might be to do with the brain damage. Lasting consequence. So you can see um, that Willie was definitely her boy. Neighbours said that she was known to have a piercing, high-pitched scream and almost constantly sarcastic tone when she was talking, which I think is specific, but I like it. Sarcastic. <laughs> yeah, right! <laughs> okay! That's horrible. 
Yeah, so she could be heard calling her family in for supper, um, sarcastically. Well, eh? <laughs> supper's... N- oh, yeah, supper's not ready. Because it is ready. Um, <laughs> no, that's rubbish. That's, that's her being sarcastic. Can't do it sarcastically. Um, I got... I got supper's right, eh? Is that, is take that, that out, Bunsy, take it out. Is that high voice? Take out. Definitely take, take it out. out. I can't I guess, take I, it I, you could see me. What, should I take the risk? Should I take the risk? I took it and I mean. Oh, I'm sorry, after you did. Yeah, so she has yeah, a very kind of piercing shriek. Yeah, which I'm surprised didn't whistle because, as Tom said, all of her teeth had rotted and fallen out. Speaking of falling out, most of her hair had also fallen out. It had receded a fair bit and she often wore it in a comb-over style. She was said to be highly eccentric and displayed odd behaviour when out shopping in the community. She was incredibly unhygienic and wherever she went, a foul odour would follow. She also had um, big whiskers on her face. Yes. It resembled somewhat of a beard. If you start Googling her name, Helen Louise Picton, the most common search is Helen Louise Picton beard get very much again not to have a go making a murderer vibes from that family Stephen oh, Avery's okay. mother because uh, she had a farm little, the farm but it's a scrapyard um, but yeah the farm was very later on very similar in, in some of the, the documentaries I looked Avery but, uh, auto salvage as you said a very eccentric unhygienic shrill character despite all this eccentric behavior the the boys are very much as you said mothers mothers boys they weren't and they were very distant to their father but that was also because the relationship there was masked by physical abuse yeah. um he didn't have a lot of time for the boys he kind of i'd want to say want to have an easy life yeah he, he wasn't a very pleasant character and yeah he, his, his life just seemed to basically revolve around getting the work done on the farm and yeah not really wanting to be as much of a father yeah, and as often is the case with a lot of the serial killers that we do cover, school life was not a fun place for him, but then being at home, which is supposed to be that kind of safe haven, was almost worse. Mm. Um, so he had nowhere to hide, nowhere to be himself, no friends. It's kind of uh, an interesting relationship with the brother, which we'll go on to talk about. There are allegations that uh, once he did get home from school, on occasion, Willie used to crawl inside the carcasses of freshly slaughtered pigs when he wanted to hide from people, and he also possibly used that as a coping mechanism for the bullying. Hide and bleak, if you ask me there. Yeah, yeah I guess that's the last place you'd be looking for. Your boy would be in a carcass. But yeah, that's, as well, it's kind of very much, doesn't seem too bothered about being around the presence of blood and the smell and, you know, a dead animal. He seems to be very at home there. Yeah, just, um, just on that as well, uh, quite interesting. or well, not interesting, but kind of amusing for me. When I was learning about that, this documentary I had on, it's on YouTube, it was a documentary, very, a lot of views. And uh, just as the line went, and on one occasion, he would even jump out of a pig's carcass to scare his brother David. The new Jackass movie trailer kicked in and it was that distorted guitar. Just as that line happened, uh, it really got a good, a good healthy laugh out of me. Yeah, got to see that when it comes out. So we know at school, Willie didn't have any friends or any kind of anyone to really confide in, but he did use his savings in order to buy a calf, which was twelve dollars, and it became a pet that he cared more about himself. It was his, his favorite thing in the whole world. When he'd come home to school, he'd go straight to see the calf and kind of spend time with the calf. Which is, yeah, which is, is a quite a sweet, quite sweet yeah. yeah, it's quite a sweet uh, idea there. I wonder what could go wrong. The baby cow was his first and possibly only experience of happiness, which again, yeah, it's quite sweet, but quite sad. And one day Willie would come home from school, you know, very excited to see his, his best friend in the world, ran straight to the, um, the pen where the, where the, the calf would be kept. He got there, the calf is nowhere to be seen and the pen is locked, so there's no way that the calf could have escaped. It must have only been let out. He's run into the house, you know, asking his parents where enough it would be, and the dad said, why not, why not look into the barn? And I think you can probably guess where this is going. He enters in the barn, and he sees his favourite thing in the whole entire world, hung up on a hook, and, yeah, it's been butchered, and his carcass is there. Again, a kid that had no friends whatsoever, yeah. and the parents kind of... Which you think I can only assume they took some form of morbid pleasure from this. And they took their kid's favorite thing, which he bought with his own hard-earned money, and they basically killed it. Uh, which and this is something that really left a mark on on his mind and you know his development and also his relationship with death. Yeah, and there's not even some sort of profound lesson they're trying to teach Willie here. They can see how much he's maybe that all life you know ends. At well, some I think point. There, there is a very farmery thing of don't get attached to the animals. They're here to make money off of. They're not here to be pets. It's been speculated that could be. Don't buy it as a pet then. 
maybe they always were planning to because yeah. they were saying they're trying to make money as much as they could they thought oh he's paying for it well there you go and it doesn't really end there when the the parents realize how upset this has made uh, young willie they suggest that in order to kind of cope with the situation that he they suggest that he cooks and eats uh, his pet calf um which bewilders him at that point oh your nan's dead maybe you should eat some of her shin it's not really the best coping mechanism um, and a bit of a weird thing to say. And apparently he was, he was obviously he was didn't take that on board, the idea of doing that. And apparently he didn't speak to his family for four days afterwards. Yeah, and his mother, um, Helen Louise, offered to buy him another baby calf. But he didn't oh, want another it. baby cow. Calf is a baby cow, isn't it? And his mother... Remember? Cows go... Moo. There you go. Pigs go... You're under arrest. <laughs> no. <laughs> Respect to all police people. The mother would then wait a few days, realise he's not kind of engaged in conversation with anyone and offered to buy a replacement calf. So where, where, where I don't get the moral of this story. I'm lost. Did they think it would be a funny joke? And then I don't think they did. And then they thought, oh, this has gone too far. Let's bring her. And then he didn't want one because he thought that that cow itself was special to him. He wouldn't find another one like it. So he didn't want to get one another one again. And yeah, it felt like he learned a cold, hard lesson there that maybe he couldn't trust anyone. Yeah. Well, what was the moral of that story? Let us know in the comments section, please, because we are, we're lost. I've said two ideas of what it could be. I'm lost. So as I said, no, ben, no. ben writes some of his gags in here. I'm going to quickly no, read one no, and no, see no. if it works. Lockdown, this isn't even a gag. Lockdown baby cow gag. So here's the thing. Oh, shit, this is gag? Lockdown has been long. I spent the majority of a deal on my own. If I was given a baby cow at the start of lockdown and that was my only friend in the world, this would be clipped, I would not be able to cope if I discovered it like that. Is that the gag? <laughs> it says gag. Where's the gag in it? I don't know why. There's yeah. no gag. No, oh, it's just sad. Cry for help. It is. Yeah. Single. Um, as well, strangely. It's gag. That's, That's a, a typo, isn't it? Isn't it? It's, it's not a typo. What else could possibly mean? It's just, you know, so do you want a baby cow? Is that what just... No, but, you know, if I didn't have my dogs and I was given a cow and we, we grew close over a period of time and then it was taken away suddenly, you know, it's a lot to process, man. So all of this would impact Willie and just make him even more socially isolated than he was before. This was until the age of 13 when Willie met a five-year-old called Lisa Yelds inside a store where the Pictons regularly sold their meat. Willie decided to give Lisa a bag of hot dogs as a present, which was a very out-of-character move for Willie. So according to his parents at the time, they were a bit shocked to see him, you know, gift the girl. Later in life, Lisa would go on to become one of Willie's only friends, uh, so there'll be more on her slightly later on. Willie dropped out of school in 1963 at the age of 14 and got a role as a butcher's apprentice. And this is something apparently his mother kind of pushed him towards. Yeah, the parents basically, as I said, they're trying to pinch pennies and, and basically cut out the middleman. And they thought having the family do the butchering themselves and, you know, with, with the bigger kind of livestock and going direct to wholesalers, direct to shops, and even just people driving past, they'll be, uh, be able to earn a lot more money than paying other people to do that on the farm. Essentially, the children would be free labour. So they, they thought this is what they were quite happy when he dropped out. And they're quite happy that he kind of given up a school because they could yeah, basically use him for, for money. And that's exactly what they did. So in 1970, he decided to leave his apprenticeship to work full-time at the family farm. We haven't touched on a lot about um, Willie's younger brother, David. He did kind of live a different childhood to Willie. He was a bit more social. He did actually have girlfriends. He stayed at uh, school for uh, education for a longer period of time. They did make him work hard on the farm, but they didn't seem to put as much pressure on him. I don't know if it's because he was the younger yeah. brother. Just seemed to have a lot of confidence. Yeah. Yeah, this would take it on to him actually getting a driver's license at the age of 16. He very much enjoyed driving around and you know, joy riding as well. And he actually went on to take his father's 1960 red truck from the farm and was just kind of driving about. And then he thought, oh, I better, better head home now. On that particular evening, one of the neighbourhood's um, kids who had only recently moved there, a 14-year-old boy named Tim Barrett, was walking down the road at this time. It doesn't go into too, too much detail exactly what happened, but it was alleged that Dave was you know, speeding down this road. Perhaps it was dark, didn't see the kid, hit straight into him, pulled over to see what happened, saw the boy... David lying there kind of motionless on the floor, panicked, got in the car, drove off home. And he actually went and told his mother exactly what had happened. She told him not to worry. And she went down to the crime scene, found the boy laying there and actually moved him into some more marshland yeah. and kind of put the body in there. And I mean, if that's not sad enough, it, it, the autopsy would actually go on to re, um, reveal that he actually died of drowning. Yeah. 
rather than the actual impact. So if they were called an ambulance, there would be a chance that he actually survived that. And they also said for David to clean the blood off the car and David drove the, the car to a mechanics locally to get all the dents kind of fi fixed on the car and kind of get rid of any kind of clear evidence. This is obviously late at night. The mechanic remembered it was a bit odd that him being so yeah. persistent it needed to happen immediately. Yeah, it was very erratic. The dad, after a while, went to go look for his boy, discovered his body. He saw the shoe by the side of the road and then looked for a bit further and actually found his son dead. And then, you know, a hit and run was alleged and the mechanic put the, like, two and two together yeah. and actually contacted the police to let them know you know, what exactly happened and who had turned up. So Dave was eventually arrested and brought to juvenile court. His mother didn't had, get any punishment done to her at all whatsoever, which is yeah. considering she moved the body, trying to conceal it. But this story kind of spread rapidly throughout the neighbourhood. I think the mother was very conscious. She didn't want the farm to be linked to this crime because she didn't want to lose uh, any kind of respect from the, her people that were buying from her, the customers and whatnot. So she tried to kind of keep it hush for, obviously keeping another worker on the farm, but also didn't want to ruin the family reputation. Yeah, and I think as well, the fact that she quite instantly kind of came to that solution as well shows that they had, you know, although they were butchers by trade, they were quite, they didn't really see a lot of value in human life either. And whether she was <clears> protecting <throat> her sons, protecting her business, I don't know. But yeah, um, very interesting behaviour from the family. So it's quite a staggering statistic about people that work in abattoirs or with killing animals. Apparently they're far more likely to go on and cause and commit crimes, whether that be sexual or violent. So it seems that it's been kind of theorised, maybe, you know, the killing the animals is similar to PTSD and it kind of it changes the way you feel about uh, life and death. And it kind of, and it's, it's theorised, you know, the thought of killing that many animals constantly and just having a complete kind of disregard to kind of a living being it can really alter the way you look at the world, which is quite quite an interesting fact. That, I mean, you know, we, we've had Catherine Knight who worked in abattoirs, and yeah, it, it's quite a interesting statistic there. But I mean, maybe that is that something that they already have within them, and then they're kind of drawn to working into an abattoir, or is it a direct link to actually doing that job that alters the mindset? It's quite an interesting rabbit hole to go down. Picton was born into that lifestyle as well. So, you know, he was bullied, he was tormented, he was teased. Uh, he didn't have a kind of any easy element to his life. Maybe that was also an outlet for him. Apparently, he went through two dozen pigs a day, which is a very high number yeah. for a standard slaughterman or butcher but not only would he use, not use a typical technique of stunning pig before you know putting a gun to its head he would actually would hang them throat, from yeah. upside down and then stick them in the throat um, which is one of the more um, it gets the blood from the body uh, of the pig quicker out of the system so the meat can be butchered easier but it's a very inhumane yeah. way to treat the animal so yeah apparently he he preferred that technique so in 1978 willie's father died and the following year his mother died after a long battle with cancer and this is something that absolutely shocked and kind of destroyed willie to the core he was very very close with his mother he did nurse her towards the later years of her life so again we see kind of similarities with the ed gain case there he became her caregiver but he was completely destroyed by the loss of his mother and essentially this left the pig farm to the brothers yeah and they would go on to try and maintain it it would end up with willie kind of carrying on with the butchering david looking after the kind of business side of, of the of the actual space but they would also try and so I incorporate other businesses, other hobbies into it. Yeah. They've got a cut shop going where they bring cars in. And, you know, it was the hiring people to essentially steal cars. And Yeah, there was an association with the Hells Angels, uh, with David in particular. Yeah, and it also it got quite, turned into quite a party place. Yes. The Picton brothers began to shelve the site's farming operations in preference of an easier life. So they saw that, obviously, with the slaughter... A house and the butchering that that was a lot of graft a lot of hours put in a lot of investment of their own time and energy so what they did was register a non-profit charity called the piggy palace good times society with the canadian government claiming to organize coordinate manage and operate special events functions dances shows and exhibitions on behalf of service organizations i've heard it was large scale orgies yes lots of drugs apparently the people were told to leave because uh, their weapons at the door there's no weapons policy but yeah lots of drugs lots of drinking lots of partying uh, and even willie would get involved in it and in considering he was very shy they both basically they very much enjoyed kind of hosting all this at the house perhaps it's a slight rebellion to how much you know how little they enjoyed that space yeah. when they were younger and it's a rise to popularity for both of them as well for maybe the first time well maybe not so much david but definitely willie 
Yeah. First time in his life. Apparently they're partying in one of the older slaughterhouses. There'd be blood on the floor. And yeah, just a very disgusting place. It's like something out of Blade. Yeah. Or Saw. Yeah. And also because the family did invest in a lot of land, a lot of acres, because they were trying to kind of hone in on what they did, they decided to sell some of the land. A lot of the land was quite marshy land as well. It wasn't the best for farming. So a lot of the kind of the neighborhood were kind of wondering why they're buying so much of it. They were going to sell the land and they didn't realize they were sitting on a small fortune and they actually managed to sell it to developers for five million dollars. Wow. Which pretty penny is, a, yes, a lot of money, which then, you know, they could essentially do what they wanted like pigs and shit. But yeah, they were able to kind of live the lifestyle that, that neither of them needed to work again. But I do think Willie was still, well, he did lots to carry on doing his butchering again and whatnot. And we're going to go into exactly what, what happened from this point onwards. But he didn't just go, okay, that's me done. I'm going to go and yeah. live my life doing this. Yeah. David would obviously indulge in frequently holding and hosting these parties. And he, but it's alleged he also joined the Hells Angels at one point. Willie began running the farm on his own while living in a remote area of the property in a trailer. The association with the Hells Angels has led people to believe that the pig farm was also used for money laundering and to hide stolen goods. So with this as well, I think following the loss of both their parents, obviously, and se selling this land, they have come into money money they have come into freedom willie used to go on quite long road trips and work kind of temporary roles across canada yeah. but he also went as far down to america and this is where he first starts to kind of encounter sex workers has his first kind of interactions there so a whole new world in in, in losing his parents has kind of opened up to willie and unfortunately does not have a happy ending and we're gonna get into now the timeline for robert picton the pig farm killer September 1978, Lillian Jean O'Dare is the earliest recorded missing woman linked to Picton and the subsequent investigation. She disappears from Vancouver's downtown east side. So the downtown east, east side of Vancouver was very notorious at the time as being a kind of crime infested area. There was um, a lot of a lot of arrests made uh, both for solic solicitation of sex work, but also there was a lot of trouble there, a lot of gun crime, knife crime, a, a dangerous place to be at night, certainly. So throughout the 1970s and the 1980s, women disappear from Vancouver's downtown east side. Also known as the Low Track, families and friends of the missing women report this to police, convinced that something sinister is happening. The police do not agree, seeing the women's transient and high-risk lifestyle as a reason enough for their disappearance. So as we've seen in a lot of cases we've done before, when it comes to sex workers, a lot of time they looked at second-class citizens, They're, the police don't take their cases very seriously. In, within this one, a, a politician actually said, in not too many words, it essentially was a relief that they were not being on their streets because of what, what kind of what they were doing on the streets. It was a relief that they are being kind of wiped from the streets, which, you know, if someone said that now would be absolute bedlam. They weren't being, it wasn't being looked into or taken as seriously. As well as with the sex workers, um, a lot of the women also were um, indigenous of, of from Canada, also known as being uh, referred to as Aboriginal uh, Canadians, which again, I mean, there's, there's horrif horrific statistics. If you look at the kind of crimes against indigenous people of Canada, um, I think they're twice more like they're twice as more likely to go missing or be or, or be um, the victim of crime. Yeah. And a lot, of, a lot of those missing people cases, when it comes to that community, have unsolved. They thought, you know, again, if it was, you know, a blonde lady from, you know, a middle class family. Uh, a lot more time and effort would be put into it. That's another thing to take into account in this case. A lot of the sex workers were indigenous people. February 14th, 1991. The families of Low Tracks Missing Women, along with advocates for sex trade workers, establish an annual Valentine's Day Remembrance Walk as a memorial to the missing victims. They also put pressure on police and demand a thorough investigation into the women's disappearances. But the police response is slow. The Vancouver police refused to say that a serial killer was at work or even consider that the missing women were dead. There were no bodies to warrant an investigation that would be a strain on police resources. To police, it seemed reasonable to presume that some of the women had moved away and others had simply died from drug overdoses. Yes, yeah, like with the Hanson episode, a lot of the you know the bodies went there, so there wasn't a crime scene, a clear crime scene. So they just assumed that you know the women would be moving city to city, and you know essentially it wasn't their problem. And I know the resources they did put into it was a, I think it was a two-man team, and with hundreds of missing people. 
you can only imagine you know how much work they can actually get done between them in 1995 during this year there was a sudden increase in women going missing from the low track area of downtown vancouver so at the time there's mounting uh, pressure on the police from victims families of uh, and, and families of the missing people who believe this is the work of a serial killer no fingers can be pointed anywhere and no suspicion is currently pointing at robert picton obviously he's a man with a, an active operational pig farm i'm always reminded of that very famous line in the movie snatch never trust a man with a pig farm so picton is obviously having an escalation of behaviors he's been traveling and roaming around canada and america and i guess now he's had the freedom of the farm to do as he pleases with and at the same time a number of young women go missing yeah he's he's he's, he's gaining a, a kind of thirst for essentially picking up a sex worker, bringing them back to his house. He would then go and have consensual sex with her, obviously for, for payment, and then he would put handcuffs onto her. He would either inject her with um, antifreeze and then go on to butcher her, or he would go straight into kind of strangling her and then, yeah, butchering her as well, using the barn to then actually hang up the victims and essentially treat them like yeah, like a piece of meat, like exactly like he would do with any kind of pig's carcass. And with this, um, it'll be explained a lot more thoroughly later. A lot of these accounts can't be uh, accounted for because the victims are no longer there. There was no witnesses. This is going through some people's experiences later on. But a lot of people were starting to go missing. And it's been alleged that they would be in the same MO that um, Picton was following throughout this. And he kind of developed a system and how he would kill and dispose of these women. Um, yeah. Which is the thing of nightmares, really. Treating them as a bit of meat, it must have been absolutely terrifying. Yeah, and the police had already kind of had one eye on the Picton brothers when they started to notice a large number of Hell's Angels kind of gathering at the farm and st all kinds of parties overnight and throughout the day. But they'd, they'd found no further evidence to potentially incriminate, incriminate them. And so they kind of, like the rest of the community, stayed away from the Picton farm. Yeah, and, and Willie seems to um, manage to just somehow dodge some allegations and it seems to have gone on go on a lot longer than it should have done yeah. um because things weren't <laughs> warrants weren't granted and things weren't be able to follow up but we'll we'll go through that which might sound quite fleeting in how we describe some of these things because the the whole details aren't there but then we'll get into some of the cases where we can actually be corroborated by some witness statements as well because i want to say he looks harmless but he also looks terrifying it's weird i think from doing this podcast you can say everyone is capable of doing anything is Hanson. He really did look harmless, yeah. Um, he said Nanny Doss. Yeah, deceptive appearances. Mm -hmm. And the 22nd of December 1995, Deanna Melnick, a 23-year-old woman with four sex work-related charges against her, as well as a charge of theft, disappeared from Vancouver's downtown east side. She was likely picked up by Picton and taken to his farm, where she would be murdered, although her body is speculated to have been completely decomposed. 1996, as we mentioned earlier, the Picton brothers had started a registered charity known as Piggy's Palace Good Times Society, and they claimed to raise funds for service organisations for events, such as parties and social gatherings in their converted slaughterhouse, when in fact these parties were attended by almost 2,000 people at a time, including bikers and sex workers from the downtown east side. Some Hells Angels were known to attend the parties. Neighbours often complained of the drug use, drunkenness, noise and general rowdiness during the fundraising events. Apparently there was a rule for the known rough crowds at Piggies to check your knives and weapons at the door. So you can only imagine the type of individuals that this would attract. So the 22nd of March 1997, Wendy Lynn Isetter had began engaging in sex work in the low truck area. This was the poorest postcode in Canada, commonly associated with sex work and drug use, like Ben mentioned. She was approached by Picton, who introduced himself as Willie. She agreed to go with him despite his overpoweringly unpleasant smell in exchange for alcohol and drugs. She got into his truck and he drove her out to his pig farm. So that's one thing, obviously, we know that they've cut the boys have come into a large amount of money. There's some link here with, with, um, with Tiger King. He would pick people from the public who were down on their luck, addicted to drugs, bring them to work on the farm for him in exchange for bits of money and drugs. Basically a, a kind of place for them to be sheltered. So a lot of the workers on the farm at this time basically were living there because it would be money for drugs and stuff like that. So he's roof able to, head. yeah, roof over the head, a warm meal. He'll sell them the dream, so to speak. So he'd bring her back, they engage in consensual sex. Afterwards, Wendy asked to use Picton's phone. She was going to call her boyfriend to pick her up. Before she could dial a number, he came up behind her and locked a pair of handcuffs on one of her wrists, unable to cuff the other one as she was fighting back. Picton then came at her with a butcher's knife. 
She tried fighting him off, sustaining multiple knife wounds, I think it's quite a deep wound in the stomach. Uh, she managed to take the knife from him and slash at his face and throat. Picton passed out from blood loss and despite her serious injuries, Wendy ran to the nearest road where she eventually flagged down a couple in the car who then called an ambulance. So you just imagine that scene there, yeah. the handcuffs on, running down the road, covered in blood. Fair play to the, the yeah. couple stopping. I think they actually said the reason why they stopped was because they saw the handcuffs. So they knew it was, you know, she was the victim, so to speak. Because yeah. I think she was still wielding the knife at the time. Very um, similar to the David Parker Ray yes, discovery. Yes, definitely, yeah. Um, she was taken to the Royal Columbian Hospital in New Westminster. While she underwent emergency surgery, Picton was also receiving treatment for his wounds nearby. Yeah, you can imagine just that it's, it's such a horror film kind of image of him just walking the kind of corridors and her being in there as well. An orderly found a key in his pocket that fit the handcuffs on Wendy's wrist. Picton was arrested and charged with attempted murder and forcible confinement. He was released on a two thousand dollar bond, which isn't a lot for considering what it was. Yeah, not a lot to charge a millionaire either. Exactly. The charges were eventually dropped in 1998 because Wendy was not considered a competent witness due to drug addiction. I think as well, her being a sex worker would have put the police, you know, to be like, oh, you know, she's, she might have just been trying to scam him. Picton claimed she was a hitchhiker who had attacked him. So they kind of bought his story there. And there's actually footage of him being interrogated by the police with this. And he's quite a very... Because he's quite slow with his speech. I know he got hit bullied for having the quick talker. He's like, nope, 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 nope. But he's telling it all. And he's, he's got that kind of gentle voice, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. And I think the police kind of just, just bought his story quite without asking too much. Uh, despite the charges being dropped, Picton was still blacklisted by many sex workers who also suggested to police that Picton might be responsible for the rise in missing women from downtown east side. I know some, a particular policeman was very fascinated by, well, he, he really wanted to catch this person and he thought there was a serial killer doing this. And he really, you know, from hearing some calls about the Picton case, he wanted to go and investigate, but they weren't able to gain a warrant to go and actually um, go and look at the property. Yeah, so lots and lots of similarities to last week's episode in terms of the growing number of missing sex workers in the area, detectives not taking it seriously based on the calibre, should we say, of, of, of witnesses and, and individuals raising the concerns. I can't understand how he's able just to walk free after such a severe incident like that yeah. based on her credibility. It's, it's I crazy. mean, a hitchhiker who attacked him, then she's handcuffed and... Yeah, it's... Yeah. And the, the Tiger King analogy is spot on. Was not expecting Joe Exotic to be brought into this episode, but you're absolutely right. Um, he was looking for the most vulnerable people possible and he found them again and again and again. Yeah. August 1997, Marnie Lee Frey was initially reported missing in Campbell River, but actually disappeared in Vancouver. She was a known drug addict and sex worker in the downtown east side area. Despite her lifestyle, she always phoned home, sometimes up to eight times a day, to find out how her young daughter was doing. Concerns immediately raised by this uh, young lady's family, very out of the ordinary for her not to, to contact home. And again, the police kind of um, turn a blind eye to this one. They don't take it too seriously. The following year in 1998, another sudden increase in disappearances occur. Pressure and protests by the missing women's family and women's organizations put pressure on the police. Until now, police had been reluctant to publicly link the missing women. A police representative commented when approached about a book on the crimes and said that the situation in Vancouver was not suited for a book on serial killers considering there is no evidence or bodies. So the recurring theme is it's maybe um, a slightly untrust, well the police are viewing it as a slightly untrustworthy demographic of, of, of victims but also they're missing and never found. There's no bodies to suggest yeah. they've been murders. Maybe they've gone on and, you know, relocated and they're living a new life. They're viewing it as too much graft to have to put in. To find I think as well, they didn't have them. They didn't actually have the manpower as well. I think because I said the, it was just getting the stage where so many people were missing at this point. And as well, the kind of tip offs they were getting, they actually had so many suspects to put in the time to kind of look into every case and link to every person is actually a lot. I mean, I'm not giving them a free pass here, but it's it's one of those where you're probably underfunding and oh, as well, you can just imagine all the other crimes going on in that such a big city. It's it's just a really it's a really tricky one. And if you've got a senior politician like you say, or was it the mayor that said, you know, the more off the streets they are, the better? Well, you see the kind of um, demonstrations. People, would, it's definitely kind of a growing concern there. And even the um, America's Most Wanted, they put up a kind of a prize reward to help kind of you know find who this who this person was. But like like everything as well, it, Vancouver probably weren't overly keen for there to be a 
serial killer linked to their, their city for, for, for tourism reasons as well. People weren't feeling safe to go out um, and a lot of sex workers would be, you know, kind of hedging their bets. You know, every customer, you don't know who you, you're going in the car with, do you? So um, a lot of them would just have to kind of follow gut instinct. And as we said, picked in from maybe from first glance and from his kind of tone of voice, you maybe aren't. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Same with Hanson last week. And again, if these people are, are desperate, vulnerable people that are trying to make ends meet, the, the more lengths they're willing to go. Yeah. In September 1998, Vancouver police set up a team to review files of as many as 40 women missing as far back as 1971. They formed the Vancouver Missing Women's Review Team, named Project Amelia. At this point, they identified 34 missing women from a localised area and background, which they narrowed down to 27 through eliminating those who had relocated. Left town or were known to have died by other means, such as a drug overdose. The problem with the investigation was that there were too many suspects. Most women who had disappeared were high-risk victims, often sex workers, so every John and known pimp was a suspect. Police claimed to have over 100 suspects for these disappearances, like we just mentioned. There are so many people they had to look into. A John is essentially a person that solicitates sex from a from a sex worker just but yeah all those people will be have to be looked under the microscope i guess a lot of johns aren't going around shouting about being a john yeah why yeah why would you yeah february of 1999 this is the month that brenda ann wolf was last seen she had previously been a drug addict but seemed to have turned her life around at the time of her disappearance she was working as a waitress and a bouncer in a vancouver east side eatery her friends say that she was never a sex worker and in fact worked to defend them if they were attacked in what she called a street enforcer style role. She was reported missing a couple months later in April of 1999. 2nd of March 1999, 34 year old Georgina Faith Papin was last seen. She was reported missing 12 days later. Her friends claimed that she had an on again off again addiction to drugs but always found time to contact her daughter who lived with extended family. She disappeared after telling her daughter that she wasn't feeling well and planned to check into a local care facility. So in spring 1999, an informant actually told the Vancouver police that they had actually seen um, and witnessed um, Picton hanging up a sex worker in his barn and essentially gutting them. The informant said that Lynn Ellison, who was a sex worker, had seen Picton slaughterhouse and seen her doing this. So what allegedly happened was Ellison went in the car with Picton to go into the East Town, picked up a sex worker. The sex worker only went with them because she was in the car, so she felt safe went back to his house she went downstairs to do drugs left picked into it when she came up she couldn't hear any sound from the, from the bedroom she could see the light on in the barn she walked over to the barn opened the door and you just imagine the most horrific sight um, and then also picked in kind of turning around and essentially threatening her saying you didn't see anything and she was like no I didn't see anything later on was interviewed she actually said to the fact that as long as picked in was given her money and feeding her drug habit, that's all that she cared about. So when the police questioned her about the story, she denied it initially because she essentially said, if I do, if I ruin this, I get, I get rid of my free ride, essentially. Only much later on did she admit that on the 20th of March, she had in fact seen the body. She did not report it because she feared Picton and depended on him for money and drugs. <laughs> Even if, well, I guess it's because it's not credible, it's not a credible witness because, well, she's denied seeing it. So the police haven't got anything there to get, get a warrant and go look at the property. It is frustrating when you see these documentaries and you see these mischances because you think, what, can't the police just go there and look at it? But they can't do that because they haven't, they just, it's just not allowed. It feels like a missed opportunity there. And sadly, she wasn't, she wasn't able to bring herself to actually back up that story and then get the warrant sorted out. April 1999, the Vancouver Police Board announces and a hundred thousand Canadian dollar award for the information on the missing women's cases. As I mentioned, this was the America's most wanted. Presenter was also on the pitches for this, kind of publicising this. And and one of the missing women, Angela Jardine, disappeared in her bright pink formal gown, leaving in a small hotel room an unmailed Easter card addressed to her parents, saying, "Know how much I love you, mum and dad." A whole bunch. And um, another woman, Stephanie Lane, disappeared, leaving behind a child with her mother and an uncashed welfare check. Though having gone into a life of um, sex work and drugs, Stephanie kept in contact with the mother, always calling her for birthdays and holidays. These sad stories here of women trying to turn their lives around, you know, have loving families. Like they, they weren't just alone, they were in regular contact with their families or had children or had, um, you know, had ambitions, they wanted to do things, and their lives being cut short by a sick and twisted individual. The missing women sparked protests and memorials lasting six months. The local authorities then upped the investigative efforts. So yeah, it took six months of the of 
constant pressure for them to actually to take this seriously. And dozens and dozens and dozens of, of women that went missing. Yeah. Because that's the thing, when you when you look into this case and when we were doing our research, the, a common image that came up was that massive poster board of victims. Yeah. And the fact that they were able to eventually identify them without any clear evidence or clear remains based on the circumstances, and, and mm. we'll get onto that shortly. But it just, it never seemed real the number of victims and how many lives this person ruined and the fact that it took this long for the police to actually start acting on it. Because often when we've dealt with serial killers that have such a high victim count, you're bound to eventually get, you know, a certain number that where unidentified victim number one. And yeah. I think there are still a couple in, in this particular yeah, case, it's, like it's two or been, three. Yeah, it's been recollections of certain people and they've gone, that would make sense to be her. Because a lot of the evidence, and we'll explain exactly why, there wasn't a lot of evidence left for police to actually look into. So July 31st, 1999, America's Most Wanted aired an episode in which they suggest there is a serial killer in Vancouver, including information such as the $100,000 Canadian dollar reward. It prompted over 100 calls to the program's Washington headquarters. Adding to the effort, one of Vancouver's largest private detective agencies, the CPA Confidence Group, offered four of their cadaver dogs to search selected areas looking for decomposing human remains. During this year, Bill Hiscox, who worked for the Pictons, informed the Royal Canadian Mountain Police that Lisa Yelds, who we mentioned earlier on in the, uh, in the episode, a close friend of Picton, had told Hiscox that she had seen women's clothing, purses, and identification papers at the Picton pig farm. Hiscox believed they were the property of the missing women. Police questioned Yelds, but she was uncooperative. It was the second time that Hiscox had contacted police about his suspicions, but they could not obtain a search warrant based on hearsay evidence, and they required an eyewitness report of criminal activity or the existence of physical evidence. So as Tom said, they weren't able to obtain any kind of clear reason to go and search the premises. Again, they've got kind of a mixture here in terms of witnesses saying things, but they're not able to clearly back it up with, you know, uh, physical evidence or... Yeah, it was, it was, well, it was, it was hearsay, pure and simple. Yeah. yeah. So the year 2000, the city of Port Coquitlam shut Piggy's Palace down due to repeated violation of the zoning laws as its farm had been zoned for agricultural use, which the Piggy's Palace parties did not adhere to. November 2000, the Royal Canadian Mountain Police presented their investigation into the missing women to a multi-jurisdictional group alongside two behavioural specialists. They advised that the list of 27 women were most likely the work of a serial killer or killers. So yeah, now they're starting to take it more seriously and starting to believe the kind of stories and yeah, they still haven't, even though they're keeping an eye on Picton and the farm and think there's something slightly odd going on there. And they've been, now there's been, you know, on file, the fact that he's had someone handcuffed and stabbed them yeah. and been told that he's hung up a sex worker in his in his barn and the clothes around the house. Multiple graphic concerns. You would have thought that'd be, you could put them all together and start going, oh, this guy but obviously it's so easy for us to say we haven't got a hundred other suspects in front of us and you know the episode is called Robert Picton so we know who he is whereas they weren't lucky enough to have this episode whilst this was yeah, happening them, yeah. though he probably would stand out in a lineup June 2001 Andrea Josbury, who was 23 at the time, was last seen. She was another low-track working woman who had grown up within a household of alcohol abuse and developed a drug addiction. She supported her new habit through sex work, working for a number of pimps who abused her. At the time of her disappearance, she had a daughter, also leaving behind a number of younger siblings who she often cared for. Two months later, in August of 2001, Serena Abbotsway, another sex worker who had a violent upbringing, went missing. Bouncing around from foster homes to group homes, she was introduced to drugs at a young age and led to sex work to fuel her habit. Serena was also an activist for the women she worked with, and when her colleagues began disappearing from the streets of Vancouver in the 80s and the 90s, she often spoke up at rallies and demanded action. September 2001, Vancouver Police and Royal Canadian Mountain Police formed a joint task force, Project Even Handed to replace City Police's Project Amelia, which had stalled due to lack of evidence or bodies. November 2001. Mona Lee Wilson went missing from the downtown east side. According to her friends at the time, she was trying to kick her drug habit and turn her life around. The 4th of December 2001. Joint Police Task Force reports that 45 women are missing. See, the number's just growing and growing here. And as we said, with the numbers growing, all the kind of connections to other people and pimps and johns, the suspect pool is just growing along with it. During this month, the task force investigators travelled to Seattle to interview Gary Ridgway, the Green River killer, 
who had been charged in four of 49 Green River homicides in Washington state to see if he had any information about the list of missing women. I mean, ironically, they used Ted Bundy to get Ridgeway. Get yeah. Ridgeway. Maybe they're trying to think, oh, it's like dominoes. But sadly, the domino wasn't for pushing. January 2002, the task force adds five more names to the list, bringing the total number of women missing to 50. The 5th of February 2002, Scott Chubb, formerly employed by the Picton family as a truck driver, informed the police that he had personally seen illegal guns in Picton's trailer home. That information met the official requirement for a search warrant, which seems quite, you know, on, on their farm, the way they operate, there's so many illegal things going on there, but this particular thing was enough to get the warrant. Luckily, in the years since Bill Hiscock's accusation and Wendy Lynn's escape, where Picton was first identified as a potential suspect, Picton went on to kidnap and kill at least 12 more women. The list of missing women now stood at 54. We'll go into the kind of the number because it's, you know, we've got this very strong evidence to say that suggests that it's a lot more than that. Yeah, finally, the officers were now able to actually go on the farm and have a proper search. February 15th, 2002, officers of the task force raided the Picton farm. In addition to several illegal and unregistered guns, they found items connecting missing women to the property. Within hours, they obtained another court order to search the farm as part of the murder investigation. However, police could only charge him with a minor firearm contravention. He was released and put under police surveillance. 22nd of February 2002, Robert Picton was arrested and charged with two counts of first-degree murder in the deaths of Serena Abbotsway and Mona Wilson after DNA evidence began to surface at the farm. So obviously Dave, his brother, was on the farm as well at this time, the joint farm owner. Uh, he denies knowing anything about the missing woman and actually in a phone conversation with the newspaper, he would go on to say, I was out of town all the time. I don't know anything about what went on. As I say, I was out of town a lot, which sounds very loose to try and uh, distance yourself there. He's trying to put himself in a certain place there. Yeah, out of town. Out of ta town. Forensic experts and archaeologists spent the next two years sifting through 370,000 cubic metres of mud and manure. That's a lot of shit. By this stage, large conveyor belts were being used to shift through tons of soil, going as deep as 30 feet down for sifting and DNA analysis by over 100 forensic specialists. So this is, I don't think we've quite covered a case where this scene is so extensive. It broke new ground for forensics. They had found blood-stained cloves and pieces of human bone and teeth amongst a pile of animal bones, human toes, heels and rib bones were found. More than 100,000 DNA swabs and thousands of pieces of forensic evidence have been processed since the investigation began. So the 2nd of April 2002, three more charges were added for the murders of Jacqueline McDonnell, Diane Rock and Heather Bottomley. A sixth and seventh charge for the murder of Andrea Josebury and Brenda Wolfe followed shortly after. So yeah, all these are starting to be linked to him now. You know, even things like the bloodstains on the floor. I think in his bedroom, there's bloodstain on the floor, which DNA matched to one of the women. He was just so blasé with it. Obviously, with the farm, you know, it's such a, such a messy place anyway. And, you know, you've got the, oh, it could be, it's just pig's blood or whatever. But it, it's just, it's kind of unfathomable how dirty and just rancid he was able to live in those kind of conditions. The 20th of September 2002, four more charges were added for the slayings of Georgina Papin, Patricia Johnson, Helen Hallmark, Jennifer Firminga. Four more charges for the murders of Heather Chinock, Tanya Hulk, Sherry Irvin and Inga Hall were laid on on October 3rd 2002, bringing the total to 15 making the investigation the largest of any serial killer in Canadian history. So there's a really fascinating bit of footage, which is so unnerving to watch, because essentially they got picked in. He hadn't, you know, sat happily given away these names or said what he's done. But there's footage of a prison cell. We picked him in the cell with what he believes is just another cellmate. And he's but basically there's footage of them talking. There's a camera in there, which I can only assume picked and assume didn't record uh, audio. Yeah. And he's openly talking to this other cellmate who is in fact an undercover police officer. Yeah. He basically knows Picton and wants to brag about what he's done. And he, he kind of jibes him, jibes him with certain questions and all the information comes out. So we'll play that to you now. I find the best way to fuck this or something. It's fucking dick in the ocean. Oh, really? Oh, fuck. You know what the fucking ocean does at this? He must have stay like that. Who? He? No. Yeah. <laughs> I said, fucking, uh, 
So yeah, you know, in his own words, he admitted to kind of getting sloppy because he wanted to reach 50 women killed. So that's bringing his number, you know, all the way up. We just said then that his, his charges had got to 15. He's just, he's essentially saying that he's, he's killed 49 women. He was saying he's getting sloppy because he just wanted to kind of just get it over the line to being 50. He also was kind of had some kind of Canadian pride and wanted to outdo American serial killers as well, which was very odd. But he also, one of the most fascinating things was the cellmate was kind of obviously trying to find out where he'd been dumping the bodies, so he quite cleverly said, the way I do it is put it in the ocean because the ocean doesn't leave any evidence. And then he's like, I can do one better, essentially. And he then goes on to say he took them to a rendering plant where all the bodies would then be ground up, made into gelatin, mixed with um, animal meat as well. And just to kind of put an extra layer of horror there, obviously gelatin would be put into jelly babies, it would be put into gummy bears and all those kind of things so, for human consumption. So him taking those there and, you know, as a trusted kind of butcher of the local area, yeah. um, that would, in theory, have been gone on to actually be eaten by the locals as well. And there's lots of reports of him giving meat to certain people, which were wasn't didn't look like pork, didn't look like the kind of marbled meat of, of a pig. It was very stringy, which apparently is the consistency of a human of human flesh. Dark meat. Yeah. Yeah. Um, very dark meat. So November of 2003, the 21 month excavation at the Picton Farm ends. On the 10th of March 2004, it is revealed by British Columbia health officials that human flesh may have been ground up and mixed with pork from the Picton Farm. This pork was never distributed commercially, but it was handed out to friends and visitors of the farm. Another claim was that he fed the bodies directly to his pigs. A neighbour was quoted to say, I've eaten his bacon, it's horrifying. We used to walk by the farm and Picton's house looked like it was straight out of a horror movie. Now it turns out that what went on inside the house was far worse than a horror movie. And I was right next door. The 26th of May 2005, 12 more charges were laid against Robert Picton for the killings of Cara Ellis, Andrea Borhaven, Deborah Lynn Jones, Marine Frey, Tiffany Drew, Kerry Kosky, Sarah Devries, Cynthia Felix, Angela Jardine, Wendy Crawford, Diana Melnick and Jane Doe, bringing the total number of first degree murder charges to 27. As we said though, he's, he's hinted that he actually could 49 and because he went in such detail about it, it's one of those why would he lie about it? Yeah. So you kind of can't help but think. If he was lying, he would have said 50. Diana Melnick is the earliest disappearance linked to Picton. Her DNA was found on one of the freezers in his workshop and on plastic sheet liners inside. Yeah, it is. It truly is, is a horror film. In the 22nd of January 2007, Picton's trial begins. Crown and defence lawyers present 129 witnesses and 1.3 million pages of documents are generated. Wow. Fucking hell. That m amount of um, digging and research and DNA that was taken. Unbelievable. February 20th, 2007. Items and images from the Picton farm and Robert Picton's trailer were shown to the court. This included a loaded 22 revolver with a big spiky black dildo over the barrel and one round fired. It also included boxes of 357 Magnum handgun ammunition, night vision goggles, two pairs of faux fur lined handcuffs, a syringe with three milliliters of blue liquid inside, and Spanish fly aphrodisiac. A videotape was shown to the court of Picton's friend, Scott Chubb, saying Picton had told him a good way to kill a female heroin addict was to inject her with windshield washer fluid. A second tape was played in which an associate named Andrew Bellwood said Picton mentioned killing sex workers by handcuffing and strangling them, then bleeding and gutting them before feeding them to the pigs. Yeah, I mean that um, handgun with the dildo on it. Call it a, a revolter. Perhaps. Hey, Dan? It's probably firing blanks. That's better. That was fair. Thank you. Spanish fly as well. 
that's, that's quite an impressive wrestling move. It's, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, it's ground up. Um, yeah, it's literally, it's ground up fly, and they believe it would um, it'd give you the uh, the horn increased libido. Mm. Um, so the 9th of December 2007, the jury returned a verdict that Picton is not guilty on six counts of first degree murder, but is guilty on six counts of second degree murder. A second degree murder conviction carries a punishment of a life sentence with no possibility of parole for a period between 10 to 25 years to be set by the trial judge. Quite staggering that it was only second degree. Yeah. So yeah, annoyingly, the juries in British Columbia, the jurisdiction by law cannot be interviewed regarding the court decisions, meaning we can only wonder why they did not charge Picton with first degree murder. Law professors have speculated that the requirement of a premeditated murder for first degree murder was not met. The jury may have viewed Picton's murders as unplanned due to the lack of direct evidence on the mode of death. I mean, the lack of evidence is because he's so considered with it, he's hiding all the fucking evidence. And unplanned on 49 separate occasions. Well, this is only for the six counts. This this particular case was just this particular one was just from the six deaths, meaning they had they had no proof that it's premeditated, rather than being convinced that it wasn't. Yeah, so this was it. That was just for the six counts, and the actual for the rest of the counts he was accused of, they didn't actually go ahead with that in the courtroom. A few days later, after reading 18 victim impact statements sent in by the victims' families, British Columbia Supreme Court Judge Justice James w Williams sentenced Robert Picton to life with no possibility of parole for 25 years, the maximum punishment for second degree murder, and equal to the sentence which would have been imposed for a first degree murder conviction. So I think he probably thought, the jury are fucked up here. I'll sort yeah. that out. And he said, Mr. Picton's conduct was a murderous and repeatedly so. I cannot know the details, but I know this. What happened to them was senseless and despicable. I can only agree with. See, as I mentioned, the second trial was cancelled as it would not add anything to Picton's um, sentence. If you were a family member of one of the victims, would you feel justice was done for your... Or maybe you wouldn't want to live through it and hear all the evidence and... I'm sure you're living through it for the other trial as well. But, um, yeah, it seems... I guess they've, they've used so much manpower on this, they thought that it, was, it wasn't necessary. So we're now going to hand over to our resident doctor, Dr. Das, to give his clinical overview on the Robert Picton case. Hello, everybody. My name is Dr. Shaham Das. I'm a consultant forensic psychiatrist, and this is my psychoanalysis of the case of Robert Picton. So there's quite a few unusual elements of Picton's background. We know that him and his siblings were brought up in this pig farm that had been there for generations. We know that his mother was a workaholic and she used to force him and his siblings to put in really long hours, you know, working with all these pigs. So to me, this really gives a picture of, of a child who is kind of isolated and a bit marginalised and socially withdrawn. In 1997, Picton was actually charged with attempted murder of a sex worker. And I believe that his brother, David, has a criminal record for sexual assault in 1988. So to me, that suggests that there's a sort of hypersexuality within him and his siblings. And you've got to wonder where that's come from. It's speculation, obviously, but I wonder whether there might have been some sexual abuse within the family or maybe some uh, sexual experimenting between the siblings. It's said by some of his family members that he had a calf, a pet calf that he was really fond of. And then his parents out of the blue killed this animal and it was, it was really upsetting and traumatic for him. So again, it seems that he's conflating human life and animal life and he's surrounded by all this death and all this, all this carnage. So it's not hard to see how he can have a very warped sense of morality since he was a child. The other thing is that he was notorious for having really bad personal hygiene. They even say that he had a fear of showers. So I wonder what that's about. Could it be that that's his way of keeping people at a distance by being like the smelly kid? So psychologically, he can distance himself from other people. Or is it just another reflection of the fact that he had a chaotic kind of feral upbringing? In February 2002, when he was arrested and the police were gathering evidence, some of what they found was shocking. So apparently they found like human skulls that had been cut in half with feet stuffed into them. They found like a dildo at the end of a gun. So this is really bizarre. I think the thing we should focus on here is that most people who, who commit murders or even serial killers, when they do it, they're out in the community. So there's a degree of danger. They could be caught. They need to 
commit their actions relatively quickly. They need to get rid of the evidence and they need to get out of there. But I think in Picton's case, it was different because he managed to lure his victims, most of whom were sex workers, onto his farm. So he basically had free reign. There was no outside interference. He could take his time. As well as enjoying it, he was also fascinated with the human form. And I wonder whether he had a fascination with, with bodies, with the carcasses in general, related to him being around dead pigs since he was a child. So I wonder whether he played and experimented with different body parts as well as killing his victims. Apparently Picton even told an undercover police officer that he'd hoped to kill one more victim so he could take his tally up to 50. So again, this reflects a stupendous lack of respect for human life. To him, this whole thing is just a game. So over 20 charges of murder were dropped. The Vancouver police and the authorities were actually criticized about the way they handled the case. And I think this must have been horrific and really frustrating for the victims' families, because even though it probably wouldn't have made a difference in terms of Picton's actual sentencing, it would have at least given them a sense of justice and a sense of closure. One other thing that really strikes me about this case is that there are rumours, or there are claims, that Picton used to grind up his victims and actually feed them, feed their meat to other people, including friends and family, which begs the question, why would he do that? In my view, this screams of some sort of power dynamic. So I think that Picton himself was marginalized and isolated. And I think that his siblings were quite sociable, but he was a, a bit shy. So I think he was a loner. And I think that he felt that others thought that he was a bit of a loser. So I think that if he did do this, if he did feed his victims to other people, it's his way of kind of getting one up on the people around him. So it's his way of dominating them instead of feeling uh, a bit marginalized and, and feeling like a bit of a loser. So I hope that was interesting. If you, if you like these kinds of topics in this kind of area, then you have to check out my YouTube channel, A Psych for Sore Minds. I'm a consultant forensic psychiatrist, so I assess mentally disordered offenders for a living, cover a whole range of topics on my channel related to criminality and mental illness, including my own psychoanalysis of high profile cases. But that's enough for me. Let's get back to the case. Back to you, Tom and Ben. A huge thank you to Dr. Das there, and don't forget to subscribe to his channel, A Psych for Sore Minds, uh, where he has lots of cases on there as well, where he gets in a lot more detail about exactly um, the inner workings of those as well. So uh, some immediate fallout from the trial. In October of 2007, a juror was accused of having made up her mind already that Picton was innocent. The trial judge questioned the juror saying, it's reported to me that you said from what you had seen, you were certain Mr. Picton was innocent. There was no way he could have done this, that the court system had arrested the wrong guy. The juror denied this completely and Justice Williams ruled that she could remain on the jury since it had not been proven that she had made those statements. So there was from the start a lot of kind of conjecture about the jury. There were a lot of people that felt that it wasn't a fully fair um, and and impartial jury mm -hmm. that had been assigned. So his friend Lisa Yelds, who was one of the few people to have been inside inside every building on the Picton property and had not been murdered, told police that she had seen bags of bloody clothing, numerous purses and identification, which again, Picton would would kind of brag about, but also mention that they were his own, his own property. So at the Royal Canadian Mountain Police, actually to kind of gain knowledge of how to properly excavate the area, studied the work of the excavation of the Ground Zero from 9-11, just to kind of help prepare for the volume of work to excavate the Picton's farm. That is... Yeah, when you can <laughs> compare the two. A national terrorist attack and how, you know, obviously how vast that would have been Then using that as, as information to help them with that. The brother and the sister actually tried to sue the Royal Canadian Mountain Police because they believed that the grounds that they searched had became unworkable and useless after what they, they'd done to it. I mean, they found human yeah. remains in it. So I think that, I mean, the fact that they even tried to do that is, is absolutely hideous. Obviously, the police would get a lot of backlash for the fact they weren't taking this seriously until a long time. A lot of opportunities were missed. Yeah. A lot of people's stories weren't believed. Only can result, obviously, in the police looking bad here. Other high-profile killers currently serving sentences at the Port Cartier, which is where um, Picton is now, include Paul Bernardo and Luca Magnotta. So Luca Magnotta from... Don't Fuck With Don't Cats. Don't Fuck With Cats, yeah. So 
Paul Bernardo, the Ken and Barbie killers. After Picton was arrested, many people, obviously it made massive headlines. It was a significant event. The excavations itself was significant in the media. After Picton was arrested, many people started coming forward and talking to the police about what had happened on the farm. One of the witnesses that came forward was Lynn Ellingson, who we talked about in the timeline. However, after Picton was arrested, Ellingson admitted that she had blackmailed Picton on numerous occasions. So there was an, a separate lawsuit that was was settled uh, out of court. They reached a settlement seven years later. The surviving victim's children filed a civil lawsuit in May of 2013 against the Vancouver Police Department and the Royal Canadian Mounted Police and the Crown for failing to protect the victims. So obviously there was a trail where they could have prevented so many additional lives yeah. being taken. And they reached a settlement in March of 2014 where each of the children was to be compensated 50,000 Canadian dollars without an admission of liability. So we're going to get into a bit of kind of trivia and like um, interesting facts since um, the Picton case and kind of legacy as well. In 2002, Peter had an ad which was comparing Picton victims to animals, which they eventually pulled off the complaints with the slogan, neither of us is meat. And so they had their billboards there, which, you know, sort of of humans and sort of animals, but obviously that was, that was pulled pretty quickly. There was an autobiographical book, Picton in his own words, which was supposed, supposedly written by Picton himself, which was smuggled out of a prison and later published. It was not Amazon for a while, however, it was later removed due to public outrage, because you can't make money from crimes whilst in prison. And yeah, apparently it was terribly written as well. But someone else, it, had, it had an author's name on it. Apparently he just went onto a, a website online and you could print your own books. It had an author's name on it, then it had... Picton, in his own words, at one of the Piggy's Palace nights, apparently Reddit users have claimed that Nickelback played there. Promptly met with a reply saying, another reason to hate Nickelback. It's too bad. This is how you pork rind me. That is very good. One of them. So Picton is still incarcerated at the Port Cartier Maximum Security. He's 72 years old. He's been released uh, very briefly for a medical treatment back in 2018. But yeah, he's, he's looking like he's going to be spending the rest of his life behind bars. Thank goodness for that. And in terms of the farm, obviously, it became somewhat of a, a tourist attraction after news broke of the crimes. The British Columbia government has since put a mortgage worth $10 million on Picton's uh, notorious pig farm property, which basically covers his publicly funded defence. And now it's time for us to do our lookalikes. Quite an interesting looking character, um, Picton. Um, ben, would you like to start us off, please? The first one I've gone for is is a bit of a, a shoehorn. Um, if you put a beard and mullet on the guy that plays Locke in Lost, which is Terry O'Quinn, I think he would be a very good Picton. Just looking at it now, it's not one of mine, but I'd say a little bit of Phil Collins. But mine was actually going to be Christopher Nash, um, who plays Roland Shit in Shit's Creek, um, the mayor of Shit's Creek. But also him playing the character in, in Scary Movie is also quite bang on. Uh, My Germs, that character, maybe got, got a similar good. kind of face. Good, yeah. But yeah, Phil Collins is, is Phil Collins is not bad. I've got I've got a couple more. Go on then. Um, if you search the term scullet, which is basically a fancy term for a balding mullet. Uh, the first image you see is is this guy, who I think looks like a very young Picton. That is terrible. Oh, that that's good. Dan? Um, but I'm going to go for uh, my strongest one, which compared to Tom's is, is still fairly weak. A less friendly Bill Bailey. The only other one I'll say, which I don't really think so, Anders Brevik with a mullet, slightly. Could look a little bit like him in the face. But I don't know about that. Bill Bailey is... Just literally a man that has long hair and a beard. Okay, so my main one, I'm going for Scullet Guy. I don't even know who he is. It could be Picton. That is a terrible shot. I think the Shit's Creek guy. Uh, Roland me. Shit. Yeah. Lee Nash. And there you have it. That is that is the case of Robert Picton, the pig farm killer. That was dark. It was very dark, yeah. It's very haunting. There's, there's, there's a very good old documentary on, on YouTube where they interview a lot of the people we've mentioned in this. They're interviewed on there. A lot of people who... If they went and gave some evidence, it could have been solved a lot, a lot earlier. And a lot of the policemen who were actually trying to do the right thing as well. But a big thank you to uh, Gully Gums for kitting us out. Mm. A big thank you to Dr. Das once again for his, his excellent input. If you guys are looking for more of this content, you can't wait till next week. And you're like, oh, I wish I could find 60-ish episodes that I haven't seen before from the guys. 
why not head over to our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash could murder a pod, where it's just about a quid a week and then you can get all the content. Yeah, audio and visual as well. So if you're an audio listener, please go ahead and leave us a nice review if you, if you can, if you've got the time. We'd really, really appreciate it. If you're a visual viewer, uh, why not leave a lovely little comment in the comment section? They tend to, to get quite lively towards the back end of last yeah. series. Yeah, and also like and also um, don't forget to hit the notification bell and subscribe to the mm-hmm. channel. Um, we're trying to push the subs this this series. So there you go. As well as that, we have got merch, uh, icmap.store. We've got a whole range of new goodies over there, so why not go and take a look? And if you're not already, please consider following us on Instagram or Twitter, at Pod. We post pretty much daily on there. It's the best way to stay in, in the loop with what we're up to. And uh, we, we've got some nice little bits that we post every day or so. And like we always say, guys... We say this all the time. Keep on doing... What are you doing? Well, unless it's uh, Spanish fly. Well, that's all right. Well, of all the things that he's done, okay. him taking something to help him get it up is probably the least well, of the we things. Don't, we don't know what he was doing with it. Yeah, we do. It's literally, that's what it... it out to his brother, maybe. Again, yeah. that's not actually... We don't know what He killed were. women. Cheers, guys. Until next time. See you next week. Post. Top February 5th, 2002, Scott Chubb. You've had Chubb, Hiscox and Willie. February 5th, 2002, Scott Chubb. (laughs) I can't do it.